Spencer, Emmy McIntyre, Sierra Powell, and Erica Tolson. Welcome to our presentation on neurogenic stuttering. Um, we are second year grad students at the University of Louisville, completing a community-based project over neurogenic stuttering for our course in fluency. So we hope by the end of this project, you all will have a better overall understanding of neurogenic stuttering and how it relates to other stuttering disorders, as well as diseases and injuries. Reiterating what I just said on the previous slide, the purpose of this presentation is just to provide information about neurogenic stuttering not only to patients, but also to caregivers, family members, speech language pathologists, and also other professionals that might have to come into contact with a patient with neurogenic stuttering. So we just wanted to provide you all with a basic stuttering definition. So stuttering is a disorder in the rhythm of speech in which the individual knows precisely what he or she wants to say, but at the time is unable to say because of an involuntary repetition, prolongation, or cessation of sound. And just make sure to remember that involuntary part for the next slide. So fluency disorders are characterized by a deviation in one or more of the following areas. So we have continuity which relates to the smoothness of speech and how often speech is affected by the disfluency. <clears throat> smoothness, um, which relates to words and sounds being connected in a way that sounds natural and uninterrupted. Rhythm, which is the rhythmic pattern of speech, which depends on intonation, stress pattern, timing, and duration. Rate, which is how fast or slow speech is and is measured by words or syllables spoken per minute and relates to information as to the flow as well. And then effort, which is how much mental or physical work it takes to talk, and normal speech is not effortful. Stuttering can either be developmental or acquired in nature, and neurogenic does fall under that acquired subtype as well as these three others. So we have psychogenic, which finds its origin in psychological or emotional problems, Pharmacogenic, which originates as a side effect of medication. Malingered, which is intentionally producing disfluencies for personal gain. And this is voluntary, so there's debates in the literature on whether this should be considered stuttering at all. And then we have neurogenic, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Alright, so neurogenic stuttering derives from damage to the central nervous system and it can appear following an injury or disease to the central nervous system in any of these areas are included in the central nervous system. So the spinal cord, the brain, the cortex, subcortex, cerebellum, and neural pathways. And the most common occurrence is with a stroke or traumatic brain injury. And there's also a lot of research being done on neurogenic stuttering, so the information is constantly being updated and changing. Some of the associated injuries or diseases that go along with neurogenic stuttering include cerebrovascular accident with or without aphasia, head trauma, tumor, cyst, or other neoplasms, degenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, other diseases such as meningitis, Julian Barre syndrome, and AIDS, as well as epilepsy and neurosurgery. And also with neurogenic stuttering, there is not a site of lesion or a particular um, area of the brain that is linked to neurogenic stuttering. So any um, unilateral, bilateral, focal or, or diffuse lesions, cortical or subcortical, right or left hemisphere, or any lobe, it does not matter. To help aid in the differential diagnosis of neurogenic stuttering, there are six characteristics based on the study by Lundgren, Helm Estabrooks, and Klein. And these should be looked at kind of as a rule of thumb. And not all neurogenic stuttering will present exactly the same, but you must evaluate and treat your patient based on the individual. So some of the Rule of thumb, these six characteristics include disfluencies occur on grammatical words at a similar rate of occurrence on substantial words. Repetitions, prolongations, and blocks occur in all positions of words. There is a consistency in stuttering behavior across all speech tasks. The stutterer does not appear overly anxious about the stuttering behavior. 
they may be annoyed, but as far as the feeling of anxiety, they don't have that. And secondary symptoms such as facial grimacing, fist clenching, and eye blinking are rarely observed in this population. And also adaptation effect is not observed. So the adaptation effect is um, refers to the reduction in stuttering over successive oral readings of the same material. So, um, and also when speaking while under auditory masking or delayed auditory feedback. So that population does not have um, decreased study, stuttering with that effect. And some other symptomology that goes along with this population, but not exclusively, is the age of onset, circumstances of onset, and also just no family history. So it's usually isolated cases of stuttering after a neurological event. So here is a more in-depth chart to help with the differential diagnosis. So for neurogenic stuttering versus psychogenic stuttering. So what you usually see for neurogenic stuttering would be the speaker is annoyed but not usually anxious. There are disfluencies not only on initial syllables but during any part of the word. Secondary behaviors are not usually linked to neurogenic stuttering. And there's a lack of variability across speaking tasks or situations. So you see stuttering present in all types of speaking tasks. For psychogenic stuttering, there's kind of a bizarre struggle and secondary behaviors as well as other signs of anxiety attached to the stuttering. There are multiple repetitions of phonemes with head bobbing, facial grimaces, or tremor, and etc. other secondary behaviors, as well as stuttering, may be episodic, intermittent, and situational. And stuttering pattern differs from neurogenic and developmental stuttering. So it's kind of presents in a different way than neurogenic or development developmental. And some possible psychological diagnoses that could lead to psychogenic stuttering include conversion reaction, anxiety, depression, personality disorder, and drug dependence, and post-traumatic neurosis. Some of the comorbidities that coincide with neurogenic stuttering include aphasia, apraxia of speech, and dysarthria, and these can co-occur and impact each other. So sometimes you see when people have word-finding difficulties that this can increase the neurogenic stuttering disfluencies, and in apraxia of speech, these disfluencies have more deliberate repetitions, so those don't go along with the neurogenic stuttering where you see more involuntary repetitions. And in the stroke population, disfluencies include more syllable and word repetitions. And with neurode neurodegenerative diseases, um, those include more prolongations and blocks. So some of the subtypes of neurogenic stuttering include dysarthric disfluency, which include frequent prolongations, rapid sound syllable word repetitions, and blocking. Apraxic disfluency, which include repetitions of initial segments of words with groping for appropriate words or targets. And pilalia, which includes word or phrase repetitions without sound or syllable repeti repetitions. So speech may become increasingly more rapid and progressively less intelligible. When we want to assess a patient for a possible neurogenic stuttering, it is important to gather the standard components that we use for any evaluation, including a case history, speech characteristics, the speaking rate, and the emotional social impact of the disfluency. And additionally, we want to assess all of the other systems associated with neurological disorders, including but not limited to language, articulation, cognition, memory, and the ability to self-correct. And remember that it is ideal to compare the findings to our patient's premorbid abilities if possible. There are additionally some important questions to ask during the case history portion, including are there any neurological signs or symptoms? Was there any neurological episode? Is there a family history of stuttering? 
Is there a personal history of stuttering? And at what age were the present disfluencies demonstrated for the first time? Some possible treatments for neurogenic stuttering include slowing the speech rate, which is simply saying fewer words on each breath by increasing the duration of the sounds and words, emphasizing a gentle onset on the start of each phrase, emphasizing a smooth flow of speech production and use of relaxed posture, both in general body posture and for speech muscles, and finally, identifying the disruptions in the speech patterns and instructing the client in the use of more appropriate patterns. Some other traditional stuttering modification and fluency shaping techniques can be used as well, including biofeedback, pacing techniques, delayed auditory feedback, respiratory training, and relaxation exercises. And of course, these therapeutic results are accomplished by practicing and teaching speech techniques to improve fluency, transferring the techniques into various speech situations, and strengthening the patient's motivation for treatment. It is also important for us to target psychosocial factors when we're providing treatment for neurogenic stuttering. We can start to do this by reducing the physiological strain, reducing the negative impact of stuttering on one's everyday life, improving the self-confidence of handling their own stuttering, and increasing participation in communication situations. And lastly, we wanted to share with you some resources for further information and support for neurogenic stuttering. Some of these links are national or international stuttering associations, and we found all of these websites to be beneficial for both the patient and the professional.